Uh, once again, we are back and we are doing training for emergency action plan. Let's talk about telephone threats. Um, if you have a telephone threat, there are certain things they want you to do. Okay? Number one, remain calm. You know, freaking somebody out on the other end of the line that is making a threat, it's not going to help at all. Attempt to keep that caller on the phone. Why would that be? They can't can track it. True. They can, they can track it. Also, think of this. The longer they're on the phone, you may be able to pick up something. For example, you may hear noise in the background. You may hear stuff that would, for example, how the voice is. Is the voice sharp and quick or is it slower and a little more calm? Um, and those could make huge differences later, okay? There's actually a information form that is in the EAP that after the call, they would like you to fill out. And information on here, accent. Does it sound like a foreign accent? Does it sound like a local accent? Um, manner, do they sound angry, rational, irrational? And background noises. So those are things that, you know, if we keep them on the phone, and again, tracing is important. Uh, while we got them on the phone, we can be telling someone else so they can get a trace on that phone, okay? A written threat is a little bit different, uh, but handled the same. It would be a very fast 911 call if you have a written threat. You do not want to evacuate until directed by the fire department or the police on a written threat, okay? Call them, get them here, let them assist and assess what's going on, okay? Do not use your cell phone. Why would that be? Well, they might have bugged it, but also to, uh, it could have been, it could have been a, a harsh employee that could have set something up. Yeah, there could be more to that threat than just written. And cell phones actually could be working as cell detonation devices at times. Unless, if it's a written threat, um, I think that the possibility of them sticking around to see your reaction, so they would be close by. Very good, very good point. If they're going to do a written threat, they probably want to know how it, how it went down. They, it, it, it may be somebody that works with you. It may be somebody that, for sure, they probably want to be around to see the reaction. That's what they're after in a lot of times. So yes, you're absolutely right there, okay? Um, once the police fire department get here, they will tell us how to, whether they want us to clear the area, what they want us to do, okay? Um, you stay in your assembly area until your team leader tells you that everything is okay after they've dealt with police and fire, okay? Ah, uh, suspicious letters and packages. Don't shake them. If they're ticking, stay away from them. Um, one thing we get, we get a lot of packages that are somewhat suspicious, don't we? Uh, called Amazon. <laughs> um, we get a lot of that where packages come in that don't have any of our names on them. If it doesn't have the name of someone that works here, refuse it. Okay? Amazon, anyone else. If it doesn't have a name that you're familiar with, refuse it. I can't sign for it. I can't accept it. We're refusing it. Okay? I mean, you want to look for things. Um, poor handwriting is on this list. Um, incorrect titles, if they say store manager or something. Um, stains or discolorations on the package may tell you there's a liquid involved or something in the package that's liquid. Um, no return address is huge. Um, if I don't know where it came from initially, I sure don't want to touch it. You know? I, I definitely don't want to do that. Um, unusual smell, powders coming from the, the package, that kind of stuff is it's definitely, definitely not good. Um, again, that's a 911. Um, they may or may not evacuate us. And I would say if I've got something that's that suspicious, I'm evacuating. Um, kind of makes sense to me. Let 911, let them tell me, police and fire, that it's okay to come back in. 
First aid procedures. Let's talk about first aid. Do we render first aid? Probably a lot, don't we? Uh, first aid is, could be as simple as a bee sting. We've dealt with those. Somebody gets a small cut, right? We put on a Band-Aid, that's considered first aid. Um, and under Good Samaritan laws, again, you can't be held responsible for something. Um, uh, and you know what comes back to mind every time I do this class is your first day here. And uh, actually a guy came in and it, it's just blip, dripping off of his elbow. And I'm surprised that you came on board with this. But <laughs> um, yeah, first aid we do, we do first aid. We do it probably a lot. Um, if somebody is having a problem breathing, we bring them inside, get them fresh air, get them out of the heat. Um, cuts, we deal with cuts. Um, if they can handle it, if they can handle it, let them do it. So if they say, hey, you know, I got cut, offer the Band-Aid. If they can handle it, let them do it, of course. Of course. Because anytime we, we're around blood, what do we... It's less risk. Absolutely. Bloodborne pathogens, and we all have training on that yearly. You, you want to avoid it if you can. If you can't, make sure you glove up. Make sure you use all universal precautions, okay? If you have to deal with that. What about the AED, the DFib? Um, anybody have had training on that? So we have had training on the DFib. It is so simple to use. It tells you what to do, and guess what? It tells you what not to do. It's very simple. You plug it in, you apply the the, the, the Band-Aid, the bandage, in, in, where, and it will, you turn on the machine and it tells you to do something or not to do something, okay? We've all been trained on that. They're in this room. Um, as long as we have a person that is available that is trained, I think we're fine. It's not like everybody needs to. There are some people that say, I don't want to have no part of that. And I understand that. I understand that. Because it is scary that you may have somebody's life right there in front of you whether you push a button or not, if you think about it. But we're trained, and it tells you exactly what to do. And if you have to, by all means, use that DFib. Any questions on the AED at all? We talked about bloodborne, okay? Make sure we glove up. That's important thing. Make sure we glove up, okay? Use all universal precautions when you're dealing with blood. Um, Cleanup should be done with a bloodborne pathogen cleanup kit, okay? And the cleanup kit is over here in administration. There is one available. If you use it, please let someone know so we can replace that, okay? Let's talk about workplace violence. And this, this really comes home to me um, because I think we've all been through it. I think... Um, Every one of us have had situations where we felt uncomfortable or that we felt that we've had, um, we've just felt like we need to get out of this. Um, when you're dealing with citizens, sometimes it, number one, citizens are not happy to be here. They've got to pay you to dispose of something a lot of them think should be free. Um, and number two, a lot of times you are the only contact between that citizen in the county. You're who they're going to see. So there are times they're going to come in, they're in a nasty mood, aren't they? Um, cashiers are probably the most underpaid employees we have because they've got to be a psychiatrist at times. They've got to analyze people. And then guess what? 20 seconds later, they have to shut it off and go to the next one. And that's, that's, that's the rate on the weekends. About a, about a customer every 20 seconds. You have to deal with this one and then shut it off and go to the next one every 20 seconds. That's a tough job. And they're, everything they're getting is stuff that's, a lot of it is, has no involvement in here. But they're getting it from citizens. They don't like the price. They don't like that they have to put certain things in certain places. So you get a little bit of that grief. And it's, it's very important to understand that 
Threatening situations we don't need, okay? We have a program on site that we call Mr. Bond that basically if you're, you are in trouble or you feel like you're in trouble, if you just hit your radio and say, Mr. Bond, in any way you can, I, can you cancel my appointment with Mr. Bond? If you say Mr. Bond, you're having people come, okay? Um, because we want you safe, but yet we know with that, what you deal with out there. So Mr. Bond is, is the word where if we hear it, everybody comes to that, okay? Don't worry about a false alarm. If you feel uncomfortable and you call for help, then you felt uncomfortable and you call for help. There should be no false alarm. Nobody's going to say anything to you about that. Another part of workplace violence is workers themselves. No one should be afraid to come to work. If there's someone at the facility that you don't get along with, that you're uncomfortable with, talk to someone. Let someone know what that situation is. Nobody needs that. You, you, you don't need to come to work and be concerned about who you're going to deal with that actually works next to you. It's not good and we're not going to put up with it. So workplace violence, have no part of that. If you need help, if you need help, you call someone, okay? No one should be mentally, physically. Workplace violence is, is not acceptable, whether it be from someone coming in the facility or someone that works here. Not acceptable. Talk to someone, okay? There are places that we can go to get help if we have two employees that maybe don't see eye to eye on something. We have, I believe it's called the EAP, isn't it? Uh, we're talking about EAP when we're training for EAP. Um, that's right. It's the Employee Assistance Program where they can help to resolve issues like that. Okay? So by all means, let someone know. Okay? Nobody deserves that. There is, if we have a situation, there could be a mandatory referral to EAP. If we have someone that just is, there's a problem there, they could be mandatorily referred to EAP. Hey, we're, we're going to make you go talk to someone. And it doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad thing. We just got a confrontation that maybe we don't see it's working out. So we may have someone go there to talk with someone and see what we can get there, but by all means, let us know on that, okay? One other weather event we didn't talk about. Hurricanes. Hurricanes. Hurricanes, I don't know if I wanna say this, hurricanes are nice, why? Because you got a lot of notice. You got more notice than a tornado. Hurricanes, my goodness, if a hurricane's in the Bahamas, we've already been told about it. We got all kinds of notice. So we're able to use that time to see where it's going, follow the path, talk about it as a group, communicate. Also, we're able to, with plenty of time, what I call batten down the hatchets. Anything that can move probably will move. So we have time to get things put away, get things stored where they don't become uh, projectiles in the wind. Right? So we have a little more time on the hurricane although I don't like hurricanes either. But, uh. Talk about loss of utilities. Again, the big one is water. Okay, If you lose water, we want to make sure that we notify utilities that we've lost water. Could be a very simple reason, uh, but we want to notify them. Um, if we lose electric, we want to notify. However, what's probably the first thing you want to do if your power goes out? What do you think? What do you do if your power goes out at home? Get your flashlight. Get your flashlight. Where are you going? You go check your fuses, aren't you? Check your breakers. 
So just because the power goes out in this room when we're doing this training doesn't mean there's a power out in Chesterfield County. It may be that the breaker went out. So check your breakers first, always, and make sure that, uh, that that's not the problem. Okay? Anything in regards to emergencies and EAP that we have not talked about? Drills, we do. We do drills annually. Um, they won't be part, obviously, of this because drills are going to happen when we're on the site and we, those are live. On the move. On the move, right. I'm going to come in, I'm going to kick a can, and what do you do? Pick it up. Pick it, well, hey, could be, man. If you're a good quick surveyor, you pick it up, right? Um, so I think that covers all of the emergencies that we would talk about. Is there any you can think of that, that I missed, that I've not covered? The fire. Very good. Fire. If we have a fire, we have two points of exit, don't we? We've got the regular exit. We also can exit out here going towards Shoesmith. We have the back road there. So if we deal with a fire, we want to know what that exit is. If you're dealing with a fire yourself, which we don't recommend. There are 72 fire extinguishers on this site. If I never have to use one, I'm good with that. But if you have to use a fire extinguisher, make sure you always fight with that fire in front of you. So as you're backing, you know where you're going, okay? You know what's behind you. You know what's in front of you. Um, if you use one, uh, be very careful. We get training on those every year. Um, and I would, I would dare to bet that more citizens pick them up and use them than we do. And that's okay, because that's what they're there for. That's what they're there for, okay? If we have to call the fire department, if we have to evacuate, obviously we want to go away from where the fire is. Where the, if we have a fire here, where does it normally start? Brush. Brush is very good. Brush. Or dumpster. How many times have we had a fire in a dumpster? Somebody throws something in there, shouldn't go in there. They've got hot coals from home, from a fire they had last night. Oh, it's not hot anymore, and they throw it in, and we have a fire. Brush is big. Mulch. Mulch. Okay? Different types of fires, and they're treated differently. Um, anybody know the best way to fight a mulch fire? What's the worst thing to do? Put water on it. Why would that be? Because you make the pile heavier. A mulch fire is interior. It's inside. So if you make the pile heavier, you're making the problem worse. A mulch fire is dissipation. You have to dig it out. you got to dig it out. Any other fire, use a fire extinguisher if you have to. Um, call 911, call the fire department. That is easy stuff. A mulch fire is a whole lot different, and we don't deal with those. But, Les, there's no water back there. You're right. Big fire trucks have a lot of water, don't they? Yeah. So would you put water on a mulch fire? You don't have any. You don't have any. But when you call them, you should tell them to bring a, a what kind of truck? Well, what they, what they now use is they what have a foam what they that does not weigh down the pile, but it will put out the fire. Remember, if you're seeing a fire on mulch, you're seeing this. Inside is this. You don't see the fire, actually. You're seeing a little bit on the end. So dissipation is the only way to handle it. You have to dig it out, make the pile smaller, take weight off of it, and allow it to dissipate. Um, fire department will come in. They now have a, a foam that they'll put on it that they say helps. But to put water on it, and they know, they know. Uh, if you call the fire department on a mulch fire, they're going to get here, they're going to assess it, and they're going to say, hey, have you got a loader, and can you, can you break it up for us? So anything else that I've missed? I think we're good. Remember, drills can happen at any time. Okay? All of your forms. All of your forms. Uh, all of your forms are in the evacuation plan. Feel free to read these 150 pages anytime you want. Um, and, 
and refer yourself to them and they will help you in, in case we ever have an emergency on the site. And as always, remember, safety is number one. Your safety is more important than anything. If we have to call 911 and evacuate, that's what we do, okay? Um, keep that in mind. Your safety is always first and foremost. Any questions at all? No, sir. You have been fantastic, and thank you very much. Thank you.